if you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, Paul laid out 1 Corinthians 12 on spiritual gifts in, a, in just a fan, fantastic way as, as, as we've grown accustomed to Paul doing. Uh, in verses, when he, after he introduces the, the subject matter, in verses 4, 5, and 6, uh, he talks about the Godhead's involvement in spiritual gifts. Now, that's a really big deal. I, I've really emphasized the importance for you to understand that any time the Godhead is involved in anything in your life, all three members, it's a big, big deal. And so in verse 4, it talks about the Holy Spirit's involvement, which we have studied. And Paul lays it out. He talks about the Holy Spirit's involvement in verses 7 through 10. And then when it comes to the Lord's involvement, that would be the Son of God, in verse 5, he explains his involvement in verses 12 through 17. You see how Paul is laying that out. When it comes to God's involvement in spiritual gifts, in verse 6, he lays it out in verses 18 through 31. It's a phenomenal way for us to see how Paul laid that out. It makes a long chapter really exciting to study when you see how he laid it out. Now, we've taken each of the sections, 7 through 11, and we studied a specific uh, study on the Holy Spirit's involvement in spiritual gifts. And we have studied the Lord's involvement in verses 12 through 17. So today what we're going to do, we're going to, it's kind of long, but here's God's involvement, verses 18 through 31. So I want you to be sure. Now, let's take it back. At, wrote on your paper the 12th chapter, verse 6, which tells you, it gives you, it gives you an understanding of how he's going to deal with God's operation. God's involvement is the operation of spiritual gifts. In verse 6, where he's introduced, God is introduced as a key member of the team of the Godhead, and what his specific involvement is in your spiritual gift. And so in verse 6 he says, I'm just reminding you, there are a variety or differences, difference of effects. This word effects, notice, in the Greek language, you can, can you see the word energy? And see the word energy? Energy. In the English, that helps us. Now, that's the, I, this is a Greek word. Most English words come off a Greek-Roman idea background culturally. So a lot of our words in the English uh, come off the Roman-Greek cultural uh, language. This is one of them. Now, notice this word here, energy, what that's about, it's the inner working, right, energy? It's the inner working of doing something. It's the inner power. It's that, well, I just don't have much energy today, right? And we're saying that to kind of say to ourselves, this is going to be a long day, right? I don't, I don't have the inner, I, I'm just not up to par, we say. It's the inner working. When you see this word, energy, you have the Greek idea of the inner working of something. And so we call operations. Notice that this word ends in M-A, which means the results. The, the results of your inner working production. The inner work, what you're producing out of an inner working the results of that inner working that is now operational. Are you with me? In other words, you're, you're at work and your energy level is low for whatever reason, and you still have to go through the day's level of responsibility. Are you with me? And that's that word, and it's, it, it, we translate that operation. In other words, what we've got to accomplish that day, what's on our plate. Are you with me? God is responsible for that. God takes responsible for the inner working that we can be productive, that we can, have, we can stay up to par 
That's part of his responsibility. Are you with me? I say, are you with me? I mean, I know you're with me, but I want you to be with me in your mind. All right. <clears throat> and so it's translated in the English effects. The effects of the inner working of your spiritual gift. Okay? Now, you can apply this to a lot of different places in your life because the principle is there of how God operates in your soul, in your life. And so this word is translated because of the M-A on it, operations. The inner working. The inner working. You're going to see how God does a lot of things. I'm going to show you five different Five different ways God does this. But he's introducing the idea now with the idea of the operation of spiritual gifts. He says there are a variety of effects, operations, but this, in other words, the operation of each spiritual gift has a specific operation. But the same God, the same God, we all have, we have different gifts, but the same God who works. Notice it's the same word, but in a verbal form. Notice it's the same word. See the word energy? See the energy? See, energeo. And it's a present active participle, nominative singular masculine. So I wrote what you need to remember is the inner working of the operation. The inner working. The inner working of, of your soul to your spirit. The inner working that brings your spiritual gift operational. God is in charge of that in your life. God is in charge of that. Because the operation is according to a master plan. God has a master plan of your gift in, in a specific church body. And sometimes he takes your gift and he puts it out of your body into another body. For example, a Jackie will go out on a on a mission trip. Rick will go out on a mission trip and their spiritual gifts and their spiritual growth will work in regard to other churches. They're on loan, so to speak. But what God is responsible in his master plan is specifically to put them specific places with their gift and their growth to have an effect upon the church that the church can have an effect upon the community. Are you with me? Sometimes you get to see it like God is showing it to Rick right now. He's revealing it to Rick. Rick is actually seeing it happen. But you don't have to see it happen. I don't know if Jackie is actually seeing it like Rick is. You don't have to see it to know that that's operational. That God has fit that into his program to edify the church. Uh, Horton goes out to Asheville and has a marvelous, a marvelous time out in both those schools in Asheville. And he's on loan. And his gift is functional here. This is his home church. This is his base. This is his home church. And he goes out there and, 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 and his evangelism goes into a, a hostile environment. It wasn't. But it goes into the world because he has the gift of evangelism. He's always out in the world representing Christ in his church. An evangelist always has to remember that he represents not only Christ, but he represents his church, his body of Christ, and Horton does a good deal job with that as he comes back and gives us reports. We're always interested in that, just like the church at Antioch was with Paul's mission trips. We're always interested in hearing. We love what we call war stories. So I couldn't wait to get a report back. I got it back from John Dyer, who was with him, uh, a blow-by-blow -blow account of it. And... What Horton's effect is, is the gospel on the unbeliever and enthusiasm for the believer who has had a mouthpiece speak on his behalf. And when Horton goes out, two things is going to happen. Number one, the gospel is going to be presented to the unbeliever and the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. 
On the other hand, the support, the kids that have been slugging it out for Christ in that school, find a mouthpiece for them of support, and they get fired up. Today, in a political arena, we call it his base. <laughs> the base gets fired up. And what he gets back when kids write back to him are the believer kids who write back who needed that, needed somebody to come in and tell that story that they've been telling day in and day out. It's a marvelous system. And you know who, I, who does that, all that? That's God operation. That's a God operation of his gift. God's operation of his gift in the great masterpiece of the plan of God. You might think your, your, your gift is just a little old gift and it's just there. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's a marvelous thing. It's, it's part of a bigger picture in the plan of God. And so the inner working of the operation or what's called the effectual working, you'll find this word effectual. For example, it's used in James the fifth chapter, verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails or accomplishes much. That's our word. When you see the English word effectual, that's the word. It's that inner working that brings the word of God or the spiritual gift out into the public arena or out into the operation of the church that fits the master plan of God. Your gift is so important, and it's so important you know it. And so this is verse 6, and, and uh, it is the inner working operational or the effectual working all things in all. That's according to the master plan. God controls the master plan, and he works your gift in it locally, and he sometimes works it outside the body of Christ that you belong to, to have an impact either upon the world or upon other believers of other churches who need to be edified, who need to be encouraged, or whatever your gift does. Support it in some way. Okay? So what we're going to do today... Hey, look. In James 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. That word effectual is our word. So how does prayer work? How does God work prayer in your life according to the master plan? Because once we have the word effectual, something's going on in your life that's part of a master plan. Here we are in Birmingham, Alabama, on our knees before God, on a girl none of, none of, none of us have met, a little three-year-old girl called Letty, because we have a connection, this church has a connection with another church out there, Grace Life Baptist Church, who two members of it are connected in ministry with a little girl because of preschool. And all of this is working on behalf of a master plan of God that none of us were aware of before we had a, got a phone call. See how it works? And enormous things will happen. Enormous things will happen. We may not know about it, but God is putting his footprint someplace. And this is a powerful idea. This is God's operation within spiritual gifts. And so this is really important. This is really important. Listen, you know how, you know how the effectual fervent prayer arrives as man accomplishes much accomplishes much much more. listen you know why he says accomplishes much because it's much more than you realize I'm going to let that sink a minute because that's what that means you have no idea that your prayer is sent up to God if it's done right here's how it's done right write this down here's how your prayer accomplishes much done right it's going to accomplish more than you could ever imagine First, it's got to be according to 1 John 5, 14 and 15. You must pray according to the will of God. 
You can't pray gobbledygook and hope to ha have something really streamlined and good. And that gobbledygook. You got to pray according to will of 1 John 5, 14 15. Your prayer life is worth nothing if it's not according to his will. If it's according to will, he hears you. If he hears you, you know. If he hears you, you know if you pray according to his will. He hears you, you get your answer. Your prayer gets answered. The other, the other important wing of this, having your prayer accomplished much, is it must be prayed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26, 27, that leads to 28. We love to quote 28, but 28 works off from 26, 27. Your prayer must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. He intercedes on your behalf with utterance beyond words. And so this is a powerful idea. It is a powerful idea. Oh, by the way, when you get into, I don't know if you wrote it down. It depends how interested you are. But if you wrote down Romans, the 8th chapter, 26 through 28, I want you to write down another verse next to it and read it later. 16. <laughs> 16, which is part of 15 through 17. You find out the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because if you're going to try to live the Christian life in the flesh, you're dead in the water. The Christian life has to be lived by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit or it's for naught. All right? Now, I'm not telling you anything most of you don't know. I'm just reminding you. I'm just reminding you. Today, I want to take a look. I want to take a look. Hey, by the way, just another idea. There was prayer. Let me give you this. Let me, get, let, let me give you these verses. I thought about this out of my way to church and wrote them down. Suffering. Suffering. You're not going to go through this world without suffering. You need to know what suffering is all about. You want to be sure that your suffering is undeserved, not deserved, and not self-induced. If it's undeserved suffering, I'm going to give you a great verse where our word is effectual. I want to give you, I want to show it to you about undeserved suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, I wrote this down, 1 through 6, or, or maybe 7. You know where this word also is found? This is, this is for some what I call old timers, not by age, but by study. You've been in the Word of God a pretty good while with us. Maybe not 45 years, but maybe half that at least. You know where this word is found? It's found in Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive. Your Bible says active. It is our word. In working. Inward, inward working. The word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's active, active, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, to become a critic of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Inner working. The word active is inner working. And he explains it at the end of the verse. It's our word. It's our discussion. It's the operation of God according to a master plan. You have no idea how important the Word of God is to your life. But you should, because you're making an effort to come and study. Listen to me. If this is all you're getting, it's not enough. If all you're getting is an hour and a half on Sunday, you're going to be anemic. It's not enough food to sustain you. So you, if you're not able to get to our Wednesday study or get involved in our Saturday study or some of these other studies going on, 
you better hit the internet and start pulling down lessons to study. You've got to have a lot more than this. If you think you're going to make it on this amount of food, you are wrong. I'm telling you that as your pastor whose responsibility is to feed you. My job is to feed you. I can't feed you if you won't eat. And this is nowhere enough to do the work that God has set out for this church to do. That one, this one hour and a half or two 45-minute sessions is nowhere near enough. Now, I can't, I can't, if you can't make our Wednesday study along with this one, you can't make our Saturday studies or hit some of these other studies, then go to the website and start pulling down and study during the week on your own. This is not enough, dear hearts. This is not enough. If you want to be active in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to become a student of the word. You can't even have an effective prayer life without knowing the will of God. You got to study the word to get to the will to get to the work. Well, here we are, point number one. I don't want to get too carried away from my point, which is spiritual gifts. I want to begin our study by dividing our lesson text, which was 18 through 31, into three sections of, for study, which I think Paul did. Paul showed us three ways in our lesson text. He showed us three ways God's operation of spiritual gifts work. So I broke them down into three sections, which are very clear in Paul's teaching. Now, before this lesson is over this Sunday, I'm going to give you five ways that God operates spiritual gifts. I'm going to show you five. Three of the five are listed in this context. And so I broke it down into three divisions for study. Verses 18 through 23. In verse 18 through 22, are you, do you have your Bible open? Hey, if I had prayer... Wow, I really got, I jumped right off, didn't I? Let me have prayer. This gives you an opportunity to get in fellowship, to be sure that your sins are confessed, to be sure you're in fellowship with the Spirit who can teach and recall. Evidence of carnality, personal sin, mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive him and cleanse him restores us to spirituality and the importance of spirituality for Bible study in the cycling of faith. So, our Father, we thank you today. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth out of this study to our souls and our souls to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. In verses 18 through 23, so if you have the Bibles open, look at verse 18. It says, "Now, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desires. That's his job. Now, that's according to the master plan. Listen, you, it's, it, it's not an accident to just show up in this church. You've been placed here. You've been placed here. It's your responsibility to, to find out that you're, you're here God has placed you here, and he's placed you with a gift that is necessary in this church. And this church has the responsibility to take you into spiritual growth max. I've got to take you out of being a baby believer into an immature believer, to a mature believer, to a super grace believer, where your life is impacting not only your geographical area and sphere of influence, your six feet, but also other places that God sends you to touch other people's lives according to the master plan of God. It takes growth. It doesn't it just, it takes a gift, but it takes growth. You've got to study the Bible and let it develop you. Your faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It don't come... They don't come any other way. So you, you, you've got to be. So in verse 18, but now God has placed the members, that's spiritually gifted members, 
has placed spiritually gifted members, each one of them in the body, just as he desires. And now, verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? If there was just one body, where would the, where would the members be? There would be, mem there would be de mem other members. There would only be one. But that's not true. That's not, and that's, that's, that's the opposite of what God desires. A mono-gifted church is not part of God's plan. Right, do you understand that? Multi-gifted is the plan. Verse 20, now there are many members but one body. And he's going to explain. We have arms, we have legs, we have eyes, we have ears, etc. Those we can see. Then there, there are parts of our body that we cannot see. The lungs, the heart, the kidney, etc. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Why? Because the body's made up of many members and every member is important to the body. Your gift is not for you. The gift of hearing, the, your ear is for hearing. That's operational. The ear is for hearing. That's operational. But it's for the body. It's not for the ear. And so he says, the eye, ca the eye cannot say to the hand, that's a gift to a gift, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Of course you have need of us because the body's made up of multiple parts called spiritual gifts. And you need other people's spiritual gifts. You're not normal Spiritual normality is allowing other gifts to minister to you, and you minister to them. Think how difficult it would be to feed the other members of your body if you had no hands. God has made like the body a wonderful system, and in the same way, spiritual gifts in the church. It's a magnificent system, and they work together cooperative for edification of the entire body. A gift is not for itself. It's for the body. And so that's what he's talking about. On the contrary, verse 22, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, less identified, are necessary. In other words, those parts that you can't see, well, they have beautiful eyes. Oh, it's a beautiful face, a great speech. Hmm. How about the lungs and the kidneys, the spleen and all of that? Are they not important? Oh, let them fail. The, body, the rest of the body screams bloody murder. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor and our unseemly members come to have more abundant seemliness. You see that? In other words, God has so composed the body, right? He's placed every gift properly in the body, symmetrically and wonderfully designed, so that each gift functions to the welfare and the goodness of the whole body. Where do you get the idea that you can belong to a church and not belong to the body. Well, I just come for study. You're wrong. You should come for study, but you should come because you're part of the body of Christ and your spiritual gift is important to the body of Christ. This body specifically. So, he uses the word God placed in verses 18 through 23, and he explains it. God placed is the word tithemi, means to set or place or put. It's an aorist middle indicative about each spiritually gift, the importance of each person, because God has placed you. Listen, think of all the churches you passed to get here. You say, well, I come because I can be fed here. I appreciate that. That's, that's not the only reason you should come. 
The other reason you should come is because you are spiritually gifted to the rest of the body of Christ. I mean, how does your gift serve me? How does it serve other people on your pew? The people that are here today and the people you will mix and mingle with. Why wouldn't you mix and mingle? Your gift is important to them. How is your gift going to, how is your gift going to serve us? How is it going to serve us? So God plays that God does that. Here we are in verse 24. Look at verse 24. Whereas our seemly members have no need of it, closing out verse 23. Watch this. Second, this is a second operation of God with spiritual gifts. God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the members which lack, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You've got to be part of a body to do that. Do you understand that? You've got to be a functional part of the body. You've got to care for the people around you. You've got to know them. You've got to know them. Through verse 26. Verse, verse 26. All right? I guess verse 27. And now you are Christ's body and individuals, members of it. Okay? He uses the word composed. Notice the word. It starts with a preposition. Soon means together. And then we have this word, curanum, my. It's an aorist active indicative. And here's what the word means. It means to mix or blend together. This arm, this arm, this ear, this eye, all God so composed it so that it could function and operate naturally and normally as a unit, as a one body. That's what this word means. God so composed the body so that all spiritual gift members are equally important. There's no lesser gift or more important gift. They're all necessary for the body to function properly. The gift of teacher is not more important than the gift of helps. Do you understand that? It's only important in its own role. The ear is only important as far as the ear for hearing for the body. It's not more important. It's not less important. It's only important in its role. Are you with me? So I, sometimes people, well, I just don't, I only have the gift of helps. Paul is trying to correct that kind of foolishness that there are important gifts and less important gifts. They're all important to the unity of the body. And so he uses the word in this one, composed. Then in verse 28 through 31, look at verse 38. And God has appointed... He uses the word appointed, but look at and, and your paper. It's the same word we had in verse 18. It's tithemi. It means to place or set. And Paul used the word appointed because he's carrying the concept of God's idea of the master plan. And notice he gets to gifts. Now, the, he doesn't list all the gifts that are listed, but he lists some. He said God has appointed or placed. Notice this. I put it on your paper, heiress, middle, indicative. That's a sequence of various indicatives, by the way, if you're interested. God has appointed in the church first. Now, he puts an order. There's an order the way God places gifts in a church, an order. Not an order of importance, just an order in the master plan of God. What is necessary in a church to get, get the church stabilized? He's going to put teaching gifts in there. He's going to put, he's going to put communication gifts in the, the church first. In the priority, in the way God puts them in there. This is the way God places gifts in churches. 
God has appointed to the church first apostle, second prophets, third teachers. Then, see, those are communication gifts. Those are what we call speaking. And then he puts the rest of them in service gifts. You'll see that later. Then we have miracles, gift of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All right? In verse 28, he lists those gifts. There's, those are not all the gifts. These are the gifts people were having trouble with about thinking they were more important than others. Then, then he says in verse 29, watch seven rhetoricals. There's seven rhetorical questions. And they expect a no answer. Here's first. Are they all apostles? All are not apostles, are they? What's the answer? No. All are not prophets, are they? What's the answer? No. All are not teachers, are they? What's the answer? No. All are not workers of miracles, are they? The answer? All do not have gifts of healing. What's the answer? No. Do they? Mm -mm. All do not speak with tongues, do they? Why? Why? Don't be trying to tell everybody they should when the Bible tells them they shouldn't. How about that? How about that? What's the answer? What's the answer? Then why are you sitting in a church with that kind of foolishness? Pray tell me why you're there. Do you think God's put you in that church? Do you think God put you in that church when this is obviously overlooked and missed? What's the answer? No, God didn't put you in that church. You put yourself there. Now, you've got to ask yourself, what are you looking for there that you should be looking for? <laughs> Because something's attracted you to that church. It's not the word of God. So you need to face up reality. Do they all interpret tongues? Of course not. Then he says, earnest, earnestly desire the things that God desires. You see, God desires. Now, earnest desire, the word desire there has already been stated. Now, earnestly desire the things that God desires about spiritual gifts. Are you with me? Yeah, Maybe. Have I lost anybody? I bet I've lost some people from the Internet. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Because they don't want to face up. I mean, it's pretty obvious what Paul said. Is it not obvious? A mono gift to church. No gift is supposed to be imagined. Listen, even if they tell you to be evangelist, everybody should have the gift of evangelism. Is that true? No. Right? That should come out of your growth. Everybody's not supposed to have a gift evangelist. Is everybody supposed to be a teacher? What was the answer? No. Can, can other people teach? Yes, out of growth, not out of gift. Yeah, do you understand that? Seven rhetorical questions because they were problems in the Corinthian church. And he's trying to correct it. He's going to say, no. Paul adds a fourth way of God's operation of spiritual gifts works in Romans, the 12th chapter, 3 through 8. Let's slide over there. Another one of the passages that talk about spiritual gifts, Romans 12. Remember, it's not the only passage. Some pastors, when they read Romans 12, they think that's the only passage that talks about spiritual gifts, but we know 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 does. And we know Ephesians 4 does, and etc. But here we are. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cover verses 3 on a little bit. In verse 1 and 2, he talks about spiritual service through transformation of growth. For through the grace given to me, in verse 3, I say to every or all among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, arrogance over spiritual gifts, but to think so as to have sound judgment or solid doctrinal evidence, judgment, as God has allotted, there's your key word, God has allotted to each man a measure of faith, for just, and then he explains, for just as we have many members, spiritual gifts, remember, spiritually gifted ministry is a member 
uh, just as we have many members in one body and all members do not have the same function, operation, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, how, how is your gift bestowed on you? By grace, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he distributes, given to us, let each ex exercise them accordingly. And then he explains. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If service, we call it ministry. If that service of ministry. If service in his service, teaching in his teaching, exhorting in his exhortation, giving with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. See, he listed gifts. The word we're looking for is God allotted. Notice here, God allotted. You're, you're looking on your paper uh, under point number two, and what he's dealing with, he's dealing with problems in the church, and one of them is an arrogant attitude over spiritual gifts. Well, I have this gift, and you don't have that gift, so, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so he says, not to think a warning, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to in regard to his gift, but to think so as to have sound judgment doctrine. As God allotted, merizo, is active subjunctive, it means to, to divide into parts. To divide into parts. God didn't make any gift more important than the next one. Agreed? He tell, tells us that over and over again. He proportioned, he, he divided the church up into spiritually gifted members. And their importance is to the body, the whole body. The hearing is for the whole body. The eye is sight. There's a function to the ear. It's not about being an ear. If you just want to be an ear, that's arrogant. It's the function of the ear that God's interested in. God is interested in the operation, the results of the gift functioning. And each gift is designed to have a specific function to the body that makes the body edified or healthy. And so he uses the word allotted, meaning to divide into parts and to each a measure of faith. Not only does he give you a gift, but he gives you a measure of faith. In other words, all that's necessary by faith all that's necessary to exercise that gift in its measure of excellence or in its totality. Your gift will never fall short of what it was designed because you've been given the measure of faith for it to function. If all gifts, remember they're spiritual gifts, they for, therefore they have to operate under the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, not the flesh. Agreed? The, 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 the flesh can't do it. If it could, then you wouldn't need to give. And it, and it would be nuts. Okay? Each through the measure of faith. Sound judgment. Watch what he says. But to think so as to have sound judgment. Sound judgment. That is to be able to examine gifts and your gift by the word of God. So here's what's important to your spiritual gift. It's like the Eucharist. When we go to the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11 and we do our exercise, there's two things the writer says that's important. Examine yourself and judge yourself rightly. Sound judgment. Sound judgment is not to judge other people, nor to get arrogant about your gift. It's just a gift. It's not any more important than any other gift. The key is not the gift. It's the function of the gift that makes the body sound, healthy, edified. And so it's important, the, he says, don't, to think, don't, don't, think, don't get into arrogant thinking in Romans 12. 
about gifts. And he talks about the gifts that they were having problems with in Romans. Just like he mentioned certain gifts. He doesn't mention all the gifts in Romans. He doesn't mention all the gifts in Corinthians. He doesn't mention all the gifts in Ephesians. He mentions the ones that they're struggling with or the ones that are necessary to be focused on. Point number three. Peter added a fifth way. God operates spiritual gift works. In 1 Peter 4, 11, uh, 10 and 11, I took 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 and broke it into sections. I broke it into four parts so that we could get a good look at it. So I wrote this out. This is verse 10 and 11. I broke it in four parts for your focus. Here's what Peter wrote. As each one has received a spiritual gift, that's by grace, employ it. Your gift is to function. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Your gift is a manifold exercise of God's grace to other people. Your gift is not for yourself. It's for other people and is to be given in, a manifold, in the manifold grace of God. That's a wonderful idea that Peter talks about. Then he breaks, he tells you, he breaks gifts down into two categories, speaking gifts and service gifts. This is how he understood them, two categories. He says, whoever speaks, that's a communication gift. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Now, what would be these speaking gifts? In, 1 Corinthians, in uh, Ephesians 4.10, he lists four. In Ephesians 4.11, he lists four. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, hyphen, teacher. I'll explain it in a minute. Those, there are four that are listed, at, where gifts are listed, there are four. Whoever speaks, do so as one speaking the utterances of God. The, the, speaking the word of God. The utterance of God. Then he says, the other category, whoever serves or ministry, serves, is to do so as one who is serving, watch this now, by the strength. Ishku is a word that means the, pow the power of his might. Your gift functions under the operation of the power of God to accomplish what the gift was designed to do it. <clears throat> the ear, when it functions under the grace principle of God's power, will give you perfect hearing to the whole body. You understand that? The gift has to function under the power of the grace of God. And when it does, it will, it will reach his, potex, his potential fulfillment in the divine plan of God. Every gift, I don't care if it's a teacher or an evangelist or the gift of giving, I don't care what the gift is, this speaks, listen, there are four speaking gifts and the rest of them, the rest of them, there are 19 gifts listed by Paul. If you list them all down separately, you'll find 19. Four of them are communication gifts. The rest of them are service gifts, according to Peter. That's how Peter broke them down. Speaking gifts and service gifts. And for the speaking gifts, they're speaking the utterances of God. For service gifts, they are serving by the strength which God supplies. Now, the word supplies, see the word chorus? You're familiar with the Greek drama and how they had people who financed the chorus. They, 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 they supplied everything necessary to put a perfect program, a perfect drama, Greek drama. That's the word God supplies. God supplies. You employ, 
You speak the utterance of God, or you serve by the strength of God, which God supplies. God supplies. That's another way, another idea of Paul who says the same thing. He does it in Ephesians 4.16. does the same thing with gifts. He does in 4.16. And then he says, in closing out his, his idea, Peter says, so that in all things... God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. So he gives you the bottom line. The bottom line to all the gifts functioning properly in the church is so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Because not only is he the savior of the body, but he's the head of the church. And we each do our own part so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Paul supported Peter's doctrinal point of argument in Ephesians 4, 10 through 16, which is well worth your read. Not today, but well worth your read. I want to pick up verse 15 and 16. Paul is going to support Peter's idea. Or Peter's support and Paul's idea, however you want to look at it. Paul says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body, being fitted together by what every joint supplies. Look at the word. It's the same word for chorus with the epi on the front of it meaning fully supplied. Every penny, we would say. Every penny. Well, how much are you going to give me? Every penny that's necessary. Yeah, but it's going to cost. It don't matter. Every penny. The whole body fit to, being fitted together by every joint supply by what every joint supplies, that, that's, that's the grace aspect, according to the proper working, see our word energy again, of each individual part, that's the inner working of the gift according to the master plan of God, always working by grace in the power of God, in the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, of each individual part, watch what it does. Here's according to the master plan of God, it causes the growth of the body for the edifying or the building up of itself in love. Boy, I'll tell you, Paul never gets away from this idea. Everything functions by love. For Paul, it all is about love. You can have the gift, but if you don't, if you don't have love, he's going to tell us in chapter 13. Mm -mm. No, no. Now, point number four. When it says God, when it says God's operation, I gave you five ways he operates, right? And well worth your read. God has an enormous role in your gift's function. Point number five, four. When you study the major passages, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4, you will find that these are the major passages on the listing of spiritual gifts. It is important to count them and then list them separately. If you do that, you will find there are 19. If you do that, you will find 19 just to give you a heads up. In other words, you, you list them in every passage. You list them and then you bring them out. You don't, if it's a gift of teacher, then it's, it's a gift to teacher. There's, so when you list them and clean them up, you know, because they're going to re repeat themselves, you're going to find 19 separate gifts listed in the scriptures. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, nine gifts are listed. Wisd and and listed, they're listed in sets. You won't know that until you get to chapter 13 and 14. Once you get to chapter 13 and 14, you will know that he listed them in sets. We have wisdom and knowledge. 
Then we have faith, gifts of healing, and effects of miracles. Then we have pr prophecy and discerning spirits. And then we have tongues and interpretation of tongues. They have nine gifts, four sets. This 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, is the only place where you will find all nine gifts are temporary. All, all of those gifts. And he's going to, when you investigate, you will add one more to it. But this is the one place you're going to find all of them in sets listed because it's going to be explained in chapter 13 and 14. He's just preparing us for chapter 13 and 14. When you read 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 30, you're going to find four additional gifts listed. After you look at the ones in 8 through 10, you eliminate the ones that have already been spoken. You'll find four additional ones, apostles, teachers, helps, and, and administrators. That's what you'll find. Those, those are in addition to the ones you had earlier, the nine. So you had nine, now you have four. In Romans, the 12th chapter, 7 through 8, when you take a look at what you have in Corinthians already, and when you find them in Romans, you eliminate them if they're already listed, and you will find five additional gifts listed in Romans that's not found in the other passages. You will find service, or what I call ministry, it's service of ministry, exhortation, giving, leaders, and mercy. They haven't been listed before. When you go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11, he's going to give you one additional gift, evangelist. When you count them all up, you will find 19. The reason you will find 19 is that teacher in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11, teacher is a gift and pastor is an office. Acts 20, 28. Uh, 1 Peter, I don't think it's on your paper. Oh, yeah, 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. There's no gift called pastor. You will not find it in any of the listings, the word pastor. There is no gift called pastor ever listed. It's an office. Acts 20, 28, where it listed. 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, where it listed. This, the word poimen, the daskalas. But the word poimain is the word shepherd or pastor. Shepherd. A teacher, teacher is the gift, obviously, and pastor is the office. Poimain. The point that the writer is making, at least to me, you could have the gift of teacher and not hold the office of pastor. But if you hold the office of pastor, you should have the gift of teacher. There are a lot of men in the pulpit today, excellent, excellent men, who are not gifted as a teacher. They're great exhorters. They exhort you. There are a lot of those on television. And they're very good at what they do. And, and, the, and, and, and that exercise. Many of them are evangelists. Some are teachers. The reason Paul is talking about it, he's talking about communication gifts. And Paul talks about it in Corinthians, how important they are, first, second, and third, and then. Now, I was taught this, and I clearly understood that. My pastor as he explained poimain to Daskalos, didn't make it clear enough to me. I thought if you had one gift, you automatically had the office and you should do that. But I found that's not true. What I found to be true, that is if you're going to hold the office of pastor, you need to gift a teacher. A 
a charismatic exhorter is not going to be able to develop you spiritually. He's going to be able to exhort you spiritually, but not give you spiritual growth momentum. And evangelists will build the body of Christ through, through salvations and baptisms and such as that, but won't build them spiritually. And at some point, he's going to realize that. He's going to try to, build, he's going to, try to establish a lot of teaching people without understanding how the gift functions. I knew at some point in my ministry I had the gift of teacher. And so I switched out of being a heavy, heavy evangelist and got heavy into teaching because I knew that was my gift. I thought at one time my gift was evangelist. But I traveled with evangelists. In fact, I traveled with two guys that were evangelists, and I knew right away I didn't have the gift. Everybody would walk out of my classes, and so I never learned so much about evangelism in my life. These guys, Horton and Hughes, would stand up and they would preach and they would get converts. I went, whoa. And so I realized I had the gift of teacher because people grew under my teaching. They, it was not about being saved. It was about being developed spiritually in their life. Then as I traveled with Billy Graham, I got so overwhelmingly depressed on the vast ignorance of leaders of all churches that was in the 60s and 70s. That I, my, I just got burdened. Instead of sitting around and complaining about it, the father said to me, shut up and get involved in it. Then go take the office of pastor. You got the gift, take the office. Take responsibility for the office. And I did. Now, as a rookie, I had spiritual growth maturity, but I was a rookie in what it meant to pastor. It's taken me years to learn what it means to pastor sheep, what it really means to pastor them. And for Paul, and it, it took me a while to come to understand the importance of this word, love. Unconditional love for the sheep. Unconditional love. It took me years. Just my own baggage. You know? I'd hurt people's feelings or they would hurt mine and that we were done. And so it took, took me some while to really understand it's not enough to have the gift. It's not even enough to have the office if you don't have love for your sheep. And, and listen, then he had to teach me that they're not your sheep to start with. They're not yours to start. They're on loan. They belong to me. I died for them. I am the savior of the body, and I'm the head of the church. You're just a gifted guy I got doing some work. <laughs> I, I'm a hired hand, so to speak. I'm not the shepherd. I'm the low shepherd. When you study 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, he's the true shepherd. And I had to learn to model my shepherd after the shepherd and not other after pastor, other pastors. If you want to be a good shepherd, don't pattern, don't, young man, don't pattern, after, don't pattern it after me. You don't have to. Pattern it after the shepherd of shepherds called the chief shepherd. Pattern your ministry after Jesus Christ. Be the pastor shepherd that he is and let him be the example. Paul learned that. And Paul said, let me tell you, the greatest thing a pastor can have for his sheep is unconditional love. No matter how much you feed them, you got to pet them. <laughs> you got to spend some time with them about their need. I don't mean spend time with them like I'm going to take you to lunch and you're going to take me. I mean care about their needs spiritually and meet those needs. Try to build a church out of, out of spiritual growth with love that ministers to other people. Like Paul said, 
when one suffers, we all suffer. When one is, when one is honored, we all rejoice. You know, how, you know what that is? That's not your spiritual gift. That may not even be your spiritual growth. You know what that is? That's love working in its proper way. It's about love. It's about love. And Paul is going to talk about that as we come next week. We'll be in this 1 Corinthians 13 when he opens up and tells us about this love and how it works, what love is, and how it should, how it should be developed in the church in 1 Corinthians 13. Let us pray. Well, our Father, we thank you today. What a wonderful study. What a wonderful teacher we have in Paul in the way he teaches and breaks it down and simplifies it and then pounds his points. I'm so thankful that I have such a wonderful shepherd ahead of me in the word of God, Paul. And then Peter comes along and surprises me. Just amazing, Father. Uh, and you put these men for us to follow their shepherds. When he says to Peter in that wonderful passage, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And what was that about, Father? It's about love. Feed them and love. Feed them and love them. Feed them and love them. Feed them and love them. I, I, th I thank you for that, Father. I pray we'd be that type of a pastor. And that we as a church could grow into understanding the importance of spiritual gifts functioning under love as we will study next week. In Jesus' name. Amen.